Up next, to discuss the truth about food and cancer, please welcome Dr. Nagi Kumar, senior member at Moffitt Cancer Center, and Dr. Yael Vodovots, professor and director of the Center for Advanced Functional Foods, Research, and Entrepreneurship at Ohio State University. Here to lead the discussion, welcome back the Atlantic's James Hamblin. Thank you. Oh, there's an article that I wrote, which is, uh, uh, was sort of about what you were just hearing about the idea of people starving cancer and wanting to fast and deprive the tumor, which might be a sort of seductive idea, but both of you are, are working to do kind of the opposite, which is not to deprive the cancer of food or any disease, but to think of food as medicine, thinking what can we give to this person to make them healthier and to make them better able to prevent or even treat disease. So can we start with just tell me the most exciting thing that you've found recently about the potential for using food as medicine? So um, thank you, Yale, for letting yeah. me start <laughs> off with this. Uh, so one of the areas of research that our group has been focusing on uh, is uh, the area of phytochemicals or plant substances that are found in the food we eat to be uh, of uh, value to modulate the carcinogenic process. And this is a, an area we call primary and secondary chemo prevention. And we, uh, have, uh, uh, we use a very rigorous uh, uh, research model, very similar to what, how we discover drugs uh, for the treatment of uh, cancer, as well as for prevention of cancer. And we go from uh, whether these substances really work at the cellular level to animal studies and then to human clinical trials. That's how drugs are discovered. We follow that same approach. And uh, as a result of which, uh, our group, as well as several others, including Yale, will talk, to, uh, talk about it, uh, but several others have discovered over 80 or so uh, substances in the fruits and vegetables we consume have a potential to modulate a cancer-causing pathways. And that's the most exciting thing that we know of today. And uh, several of our research groups have embarked on uh, e examining this uh, on specific ca cancers. And I, I, I think uh, that is the most exciting thing that we're doing at Moffitt. So it's, you're taking, you know, I, I've been told to eat fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. but you're taking, breaking down the chemicals within them and, and studying what exactly is having what effect on... Food. Exactly. Exa for example, uh, green tea catechins. We know from population studies that populations that consume green tea have the lowest incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, even if they do have prostate cancer, they don't die from prostate cancer, they die with prostate cancer, and this is the Asian population, Japan, China, and countries like that. So that gave us an impetus to look at it in vitro or in cells, in prostate cells, to see whether what is the substance in green tea that makes that happen, makes that uh, cancer not get aggressive. And that was what led us to go from cell studies to humans on looking at green tea catechins to prevent prostate cancer progression. Right, okay. Whenever I write about these things, people say, oh, it's just a correlation between green tea and survival. How do you actually know it's real? But you're breaking that down so you could actually say, no, exactly. this compound does prove, right. does actually affect right. this particular pathway. Exactly. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so th there's a potential to actually be developing these things as drugs, or there's a potential to actually just change the way people eat food? Well, and I guess um, it should be, so I'm a food scientist and I work very collaboratively with human nutrition, with the, um, our cancer center, the James. Um, and what we do is we usually take a lot of the studies, maybe the animal studies, cell studies, and then we translate it to human trials. But now we take some of these uh, bioactives or active compounds that were found in foods and vegetables, we actually use those to formulate foods. So these are foods normal that you normally eat. It could be um, a favorite of ours is uh, candy or confections, and we can manipulate that confection 
to have a lot of, for example, black raspberries or blueberries in them. And then they go into feeding trials in the cancer center with, um, usually with patients. Um, and just to look at uh, a whole different things with black raspberry, we looked at oral cancer. Um, blueberries, we're looking at cognitive, uh, some cognitive dysfunction. So real, real food products. We've developed um, soy bread that went into prostate cancer trials. But what we hope is that you know you have a bunch of different foods that you normally eat, and now you're just going to take these because potentially they can help with prevention of, of cancer as well. But we study it in a very metho methodical way, just like Nagi mentioned, that we look at all the all the different um, potential pathways that they can help right. with cancer. Okay. So, yeah. uh, our take is a little different. I mean, uh, I think we all get there the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, think that the quantity of the bioactive compound, take for example the green tea, the most bioactive component of the catechins, there are about five substances, uh, the phytochemicals and green tea, and one of them is the most potent and most bioactive. But if you give it just by itself as one molecule, it doesn't work. You have to give it as a, a whole component in green tea. Yeah. So we've developed drugs based on that because we, the quantity is so high that one can't drink uh, 12 cups of green tea a day or you'd be near a, you know, in a toilet the whole day or something like that. So, yeah. uh, and it's also the caffeine content is also very high in 12 cups of green tea. So there's uh, adverse events related to that. So we, we have been very methodical and systematic about developing a drug uh, in an encapsulated form that we are testing. This also uh, goes through a rigorous uh, inspection by the Food and Drug Administration. We get an investigational new drug approval for it before we take it to patients, huh. which is a typical drug development model. Right. But using green tea catechins. Using extracts yes, from Yes, from food. Uh, botanicals. Okay, okay. So we're kind of seeing a merging here but the, uh, between pharmaceuticals and yes. food, and um, it's both, both of your approaches are based on the premise that food yes. is right. I guess in, 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 yeah, in our case, is, um, we study a lot of prevention rather than a cure. Uh, I mean, we, there is some studies in cure, but prevention is really our, our main target. And when you think of prevention, that's like almost lifelong uh, for some of these, especially cancer. So when you're thinking about that, you want to try and have it fit into your diet. Um, and But what we do differently than just say, hey, eat two cups of blueberries a day, which is a great thing, don't get me wrong. But not everyone can have access to two cups of blueberries. Um, they may not be available year-round. So we develop foods that contain these. Um, and in higher amounts, so for example, in the, in the berries, we freeze dry them, meaning that we remove all the water, so now they concentrate it. It's still the whole berry, it just doesn't have the water, and we use that as the ingredient to make our, our, our products. So now it is concentrated, but it's not the same. And, and they have the shelf stability, et cetera, that required for food. So if I go right now to a lot of, actually any pharmacy or grocery store, I get either rows of supplements, which uh, an average consumer might think is this is already what you're talking about. It's already out there and for sale. So how is what you're doing different from um, <laughs> this enormous industry? So this is a, a challenge for us uh, because what's out there in the shelf is not tested by anyone. Um, so FDA doesn't have any uh, testing done on the over-the-counter available supplements. Uh, so we don't recommend them unless these studies uh, I wish more uh, groups like ours would be doing and we'd have a robust research program in every cancer center around the country who's uh, doing the work that we do to evaluate more agents. But the ones on the shelf is not we, what we recommend at all because the potency uh, is not there. I mean, ours, we even test it every year to make sure that the, uh, the bioactive agent that we are evaluating and we think can modulate the cancer process is really there. So we, uh, there's a shelf life for all these agents. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very much more complicated than buying it off the shelf. Right. And for us, it's the foods that were specifically formulated. Like I said, the concentrations may be higher or a little different. It also is a, a fact that 
you know, um, sometimes um, you, you did a test in something like, for example, prostate cancer. That does not mean that oral cancer you'll have the same or in another, you know, or in another cohort or, so there's a lot of, of, uh, of things that can change and, and just by saying, oh, this happened to be good in mice doing whatever, doesn't mean that it will translate very well to a bunch of different things. So, um, yeah, we're very systematic, I think, that that's, that's a great thing, and which is not normal for the food industry either. I mm -hmm. mean, this is not something that they normally do because it's not their potential job to, for disease prevention, right? But um, we hope to get there. We hope that that's something that, that there's an interest in and it moves in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to say, instead of buying, uh, spending money on these supplements, I think uh, uh, what we are recommending until these studies are finished uh, several of these studies are in phase one, phase two, uh, which is close to, you know, being uh, finished. But until then, we, our recommendation is to eat as many plant foods as possible. Uh, so really, three quarters of your plate should be dark blue, uh, yellow, orange, green uh, vegetables and fruits. And uh, the predominant plant-based diet is what we are recommending. And I always say, paint your plate like a painter's palette. And uh, that's a good thing to remember. Yeah, yeah. So you're not upending conventional wisdom about what healthy foods exactly. are, but you're thinking of new ways to be more strategic about actually giving an evidence-based approach to people with certain diseases or conditions. Exactly. Okay. Um, so one of the sometimes when I interview people from the pharmaceutical industry about, say, something like drug prices and uh, a drug will cost several thousand dollars a month, and they say, well, that's because you know our overhead was a lot to do all the testing and to prove that it works and to prove that it's safe. Um, and one of the reasons people are drawn to buy supplements at Whole Foods is that they're relatively inexpensive. They figure worth worth a shot. So how do, we, how do you avoid getting into a place where we're thinking about these compounds from food once they go through this testing process, ending up being very expensive or inaccessible? I think this is available in nature, so I don't foresee it being uh, expensive. Uh, even as a, a trialist, I'm a clinical trialist, I'm a translational uh, scientist, and we buy these from the general market. I mean, we buy it and we formulate it, and it's not expensive at all. I mean, compared to the drugs uh, that are available uh, by, uh, from pharma, uh, which we're not, you know, um, it, that's important too. Yeah. Uh, but these, co comparatively, the cost is very, very low. And, and think about this being um, implemented internationally. Uh, it'll be available to everyone easily. And it's available in nature, so we're not going to go patent uh, every botanical we develop into a drug. Oh. Because it's available. It just has to be formulated right. Well, and in our case, we, we work what we call from the crops to the clinic to the consumer. So we actually work with farmers um, to develop um, or use particular varieties of, for example, tomatoes that are high in lycopene, which is one of the compounds. And so those we'd probably want to use those tomatoes versus some others because they, they happen to that variety be that way. And then we, we do all the food science, we get the, the, the product, um, we go through the clinic, and then, of course, I mean, ideally, we'd like to translate that out to the public, and that's through commercializations of the products. But it, the, the food industry, the, some of the margins are very low <laughs> for any, any kind of profit, so they're used to that. So it's not, they know consumers, we may not buy certain foods just because, yeah. you know, supposedly they're better for them, so. And consumers care about things like taste. Yeah. And taste and, and shelf life and yeah. yeah. So yeah, and actually that's that's like I guess that's a that's a good point. I mean when we develop foods unlike some of the um, some of what Nagi does, we have to take everything the farmer does, but then also apply everything that, that the foods the food science does. So the product needs to taste good, has a shelf life, has the texture you want, has to you know, be appealing in a million ways, um, and because you want to be able to eat it all the time. So that's an extra added issue that we deal with when we develop the food, which, which is always an... Obvious. This is an enormous task. <laughs> yes, and yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, I have to tell you this anecdote, how I know ale, mm -hmm. is we tried to develop a, a gummy bear with uh, a blueberry anthocyanin or a berry anthocyanin, and we wanted to really test this in a phase two trial at St. Jude's and among children. And we knew they were not going to swallow capsules or eat two bowls of blueberries daily. And you know, we're still trying to get it not to taste bitter. 
uh, that's how concentrated the, so the uh, taste was very important. I mean, if yeah. you were going to give it to uh, children as cancer survivors, it had to taste like a, a good gummy bear. And I kept telling Yale, <laughs> add more sugar, it's okay, <laughs> it's only Not children. Uh, but we, we, yeah. that's how I met Yale. Yeah, uh, and, and it's yeah. interesting because that trial did, this is something that's, that's we, you know, um, offline we're discussing a little bit, is that the um, extracts is what is normally used because they're high in certain bioactives. We try to use the whole fruit, so what we actually just finished is a trial comparing the, the blueberry gummies that were made with the extract to whole blueberries to see bioavailability and how some of these bioactives, and they find that they're very comparable. So just as to show that we can actually do, do move on with the whole food, which is something that we've always been very big wow. advocate of. So. Yeah, that's a novel concept. So we, um, you're actually thinking of essentially a, a treatment or preventive measure for, for cancers that is also taking into account patients' preferences or enjoyment mm -hmm. of actually oh, taking yeah. it, not yeah. just the effectiveness. Of course. Um, uh, we have time for a, 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 just one question here, and there's already one up, so uh, I'll go to that. What is the current landscape of lifestyle clinical trials, diet and exercise before, during, and after cancer? This is a very expansive question, so maybe um, how <laughs> much, how, how do we integrate what you're doing more widely into a system that tends to think, oh, if it's not a pharmaceutical, then um, it's some other thing which you're welcome to experiment with, but we don't take seriously. Uh, and I, I, the problem with um, doing lifestyle interventions uh, in randomized clinical trials is that food, especially, um, is not just nutrients or it's not just medicine. It's more than that. It's culture, it's history, it's uh, um, you know, supportive care for some people. Uh, so it's much more than that. So it's the most complex group of studies that you'll ever do if you do lifestyle interventions. And so we don't have many of these trials out there. So everything that we are recommending now is based on the silos. I mean, people who work in uh, physical activity and cancer, mm -hmm. people who uh, work in nutrition and cancer, uh, people who work in uh, sun exposure and cancer, or tobacco use and cancer, and bringing all that information together and making recommendations as we move on, mm -hmm. rather than having lifestyle interventions where we, you make an ideal person do everything you think we want them to do. Right. Those are uh, technically difficult uh, randomized clinical trials to do because of the reasons I described. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and I mean, I think very quickly just to say that when we do our trials, we try to control the diet, the rest of the diet, obviously, somewhat, but it's, it's really asking a very specific question about the intervention food rather than an entire lifestyle because, again, so many vi uh, variables to take care of. So if you want to show efficacy of a specific food, you're going to have to kind of concentrate on that. So. Right, right. Um, well, I look forward to following your work. Thank you very much for talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.